happy little games. Hello everybody, just wanted to say a few words before the video starts. Thanks for all the positive response I've received for this five part series. I had a lot of requests asking me to combine them all into one video which I have done and it now runs close to two hours. I have edited the videos together to make it more seamless. So if you missed a few parts or just want to watch the whole thing over again, grab some hot buttered popcorn or even a hot dog. Sit back and enjoy the show. Also, don't forget to leave a like if you're enjoying it as I'm still trying to grow my channel. Thank you everyone. Evil. Since the dawn of time, there has been a constant struggle between the forces of good and the forces of evil. Just take a look throughout history and you will see the various nefarious beings that have brought death and destruction to our world. Names such as Genghis Khan, Hitler, Stalin, and even my wife. But one of the most evil villains to ever grace our earth would have to be Vlad the Impaler. He was the real life inspiration for Bram Stoker's 1897 epic novel Dracula and is the primary antagonist in the series we are talking about today, Castlevania. Why did the original developer choose a whip as the main weapon for your character? What were the differences between the Japanese and USA versions? So grab your crucifix and don't forget the garlic. This is the history of Castlevania. It's a bit tricky to pinpoint exactly who came up with the actual concept of the game, but going back to 1985, Konami developer Hitoshi Akamatsu was probably our best bet. At the time, Konami producers were forbidden to include the names in the credits of their games that they had created for fear of other companies stealing them away. Over the last 35 years, he has come forward and shared a few details about the creation of this game. He had grown up loving the Universal Monster flicks which included the usual cast of characters such as the Mummy, the Wolfman, Frankenstein's monster, and of course the Prince of Darkness himself, Dracula. He didn't just love the original movies in the series, but also loved the spin-offs as well, including Son of Frankenstein and Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman. He wanted to design a game where people would feel as if they were actually in a horror movie, and in my opinion, he pulled this off perfectly. His love of these classic movies ran deep, with the character name of Alucard being lifted straight from the 1943 movie Son of Dracula. Mr. Akamatsu loved western films as did most of the game designers in Konami's offices, specifically Raiders of the Lost Ark. He thought the whip was very effective with the type of story he wanted to tell, so he decided to give it to the main character. Mr. Akamatsu was very concerned with the controls and wanted to make sure they were synced up as tight as possible with the character animation. He had wanted the whip to feel like an extension of the character's body. The game was initially developed for the Famicom Disk System in Japan under the name Akumaho Dracula. It was changed to Castlevania for the Western release because the title literally translated into Devil's Castle Dracula, and the bosses at Konami did not like the satanic overtones. Konami. Castlevania was released in 1987 in North America. The game takes place across six levels of run and whip action. As the story goes, you take on the role of Simon Belmont, who was a descendant of the Belmont clan, a family of vampire killers who for centuries have taken down the ultimate vampire himself. 
you make your way to Transylvania and fight your way through Dracula's castle encountering all sorts of supernatural baddies such as skeletons, ghosts, Medusa, and even a skeleton dragon. Some of the mini bosses you encounter are Frankenstein's monster in Igor, the Grim Reaper, the Mummy, and finally Dracula himself among others. Your whip is your primary weapon and goes by the name of Vampire Killer which was passed down through the Belmont clan to take out each version of Dracula who just happens to resurrect every 100 years. The A button allows you to jump but you cannot change direction in midair so everything has to be pretty precise. Pressing the B button will let you crack that whip taking out any and everything all around you. Littered throughout the levels are breakable candles which will give you hearts, power-ups, and point bonuses. Along with your trusty vampire killer, you do have a few sub-weapons you can pick up. There are daggers which are just the weakest in my opinion, a tilted boomerang which looks suspiciously like a cross, just don't tell Nintendo, holy water, which any self-respecting vampire hunter should have at least a gallon of, can be thrown on the ground and allows multiple hits to be given to the enemy. An axe, and also a stopwatch, which will momentarily freeze everything on screen. There are various secret items behind walls that you can break with your whip, so be on the lookout for those. The difficulty is perfectly balanced, with the gameplay gradually getting harder and harder the further into it you get. Something else that is fantastic is the music, which sets the mood perfectly for an old creepy monster movie-like vibe. The music was composed independently by Satoe Tirashima and Kanuyo Yamashita with the title track of Vampire Killer being reused in numerous sequels ever since. For an early NES title, the game is definitely a must play, especially if you are a fan of the old school monster flicks. It was ported to a number of home computers as well, and I will cover them at the end of the video, so stay tuned if you like that sort of thing. At the same time the original was being developed for the Famicom Disk System, a version was put out for the MSX2 computer entitled Vampire Killer. While the story and enemies are pretty much the same, this is not a straight up conversion of the Nintendo Classic. The gameplay is more linear and features labyrinth like stages where you have to seek out the skeleton key to unlock the door and exit each stage. Due to the limitations of the MSX2 hardware, the screen doesn't scroll but uses a flick screen technique instead. This, however, does not hinder the gameplay at all, and everything does feel really nice. The graphics are given a bit of an upgrade as well, with more colors being used throughout the game. The music is very good, although not quite up there with the NES original. Not only can you break candles and walls to reveal items, you can also purchase them through merchants hidden throughout the levels. There are other power-ups not included in the original NES title such as limited invulnerability, increased speed, and jumping height and energy. It's a fun little entry in the series that the western market didn't get a chance to experience. With the light RPG elements added, you can tell this is where the series was headed when Castlevania II debuted on the NES. Castlevania II Simon's Quest was released in 1987. 
This time, you take on the role of Simon Belmont, who has to go on a journey to undo a curse put on him by Count Dracula at the end of the first game. To do this, you have to find Dracula's body parts, which have been scattered all over Transylvania. Return them to the castle and burn them. It's good old-fashioned, family-friendly entertainment. Similar to Vampire Killer on the MSX, the game adds more RPG elements, making it one of the first American-released Metroidvania-style games that we would see in the wildly successful Castlevania Symphony of the Night. You start out the game with a standard whip, which can be upgraded to a chain, and finally a flaming whip for maximum damage. The sub-weapons are also back, including daggers, crystals, and holy water. Since the gameplay is non-linear, it features a world map which you can explore and revisit at any time. You can talk to villagers who may offer helpful advice or just flat out lie to you. There are also merchants you can visit to purchase items or access to hidden areas. For each enemy you kill, you gain valuable experience points which will increase your maximum health. Another unique addition is night and day cycles where more powerful enemies will appear during the nighttime hours. While the game doesn't appear to be as difficult as the original, it's still challenging and you will probably have to make your own map because a lot of the scenery appears to be very similar. For me personally, I like the more straight up action of the first game, but I can appreciate the RPG elements that were introduced here. Besides, anything that inspires Symphony of the Night is A-OK -okay with me. There was a bit of controversy surrounding the magazine Nintendo Power and this game. The September 1988 edition showed Simon Belmont on the cover holding up a severed head of Dracula. A lot of parents wrote in and complained that this was too disturbing for their children. And looking at the image now, I would have to agree. In the 1980s and the 1990s, Konami had numerous arcade hits and were considered one of the best in the industry. They decided to take Castlevania and bring it into the arcades, creating a whole new adventure with improved graphics and sound. The game was entitled Haunted Castle and was released in 1987. The game plays very similar to the original Castlevania with your character using a whip as his primary weapon. By defeating certain enemies, you can upgrade your primary weapon to a Morning Star, and then finally to a sword. You also have sub-weapons to pick up, just like in the original, such as a boomerang, bombs, stopwatches, and crosses, among others. There are six stages in total, with the usual assortment of ghosts and goblins to get rid of, including skeletons, hunchbacks, and zombies. At the end of each stage, there is a boss fight, and you will encounter Medusa, Frankenstein's monster, and finally Dracula. The sprites are large and in charge, and the animation is nice and smooth. The music is fantastic and really sets the mood for each level. This was a fairly successful arcade game in Japan, but it didn't make much of a dent over here in the States. Most people did not even get the Castlevania connection due to the different name. Some people have complained that the gameplay is a bit too slow, but I thought it was perfectly fine. It never received any home conversions, but in 2017 it was released on the PlayStation Network as part of the Arcade Archives collection. In 2019 it was also released as part of Konami's Arcade Classics Anniversary Collection, and it was released for Xbox, PlayStation, Nintendo Switch, and PC. In 
1989, the series made its debut on the Game Boy with a title simply called The Castlevania Adventure. It starts off very similar to the original, only this time you're not playing as Simon Belmont, but as his ancestor Christopher. He does brandish his trademark whip, but the first thing you notice when playing is there are no sub-weapons. There are candles to destroy, but they only hold score bonuses for the most part. It is possible to upgrade your whip, but if you take a hit, you will lose that upgrade, which is just a tad bit frustrating. There are four levels in total, and you only have three lives to use. The gameplay itself is extremely slow and plodding. The original Game Boy had a problem with screen blur if the scrolling was too fast for the screen to keep up. Perhaps they did this intentionally to keep the blur at a minimum. The audio was really good with excellent music and sound effects throughout. I had this back in the day and enjoyed it especially on road trips with my family. In 1990, we received Castlevania III Dracula's Curse for the NES. Since Konami figured this was probably their last Castlevania game on the 8-bit Nintendo, they decided to go all out and put everything they could into the game. For starters, it ditches the RPG and action-adventure elements of Simon's Quest and returns it to the platforming elements found in the first game. There are 15 levels in total and 4 different characters you can play as. It also includes a password system as well as 4 slightly different endings. There are also multiple paths throughout the game making for a much more varied experience. The game is a prequel where you take on the role of Trevor Belmont, who is in possession of the Vampire Killer and have to take down Count Dracula. Along your quest, you have three possible companions, but only one can accompany you at any given time. You can play as them by pressing the select button. Your three compadres are a sorceress, pirate, and Dracula's son. Each of your traveling Wilburys have different abilities. You do get a slightly different ending depending on which companion you complete the game with. The graphics and animation are fantastic and easily the best on the NES hardware. The backgrounds with their rotating gears and swinging pendulums in particular are very impressive for a 1990 8-bit NES game. Not to beat a dead horse, but the music and sound effects are absolutely fantastic. The best in the series on the original NES in my opinion. The game did have some censorship with Medusa now brandishing a shirt and topless statues also finding the time to cover up their assets. All religious imagery such as crosses were also removed. In 1991, Konami released Castlevania II Belmont's Revenge for the Game Boy. This is a great follow-up to the original Game Boy title with you once again taking on the role of Christopher Belmont as he sets out on a quest to rescue his son from the clutches of the dastardly Count Dracula. This game takes place across four levels including Crystal, Cloud, Plant, and Rock. Quite a bit different than the standard castles and forests of the previous Castlevania games. Similar to the Mega Man series, you can play through these levels in any order you like. Another welcome addition to the portable entry is the reappearance of the sub-weapons, although this time around you only get two. The Holy Water and the Axe. In the Japanese version, the Axe is replaced with a cross. The Vampire Killer can be upgraded to a Flaming Whip, but thankfully it can't be downgraded for the most part. The graphics and animation are good and a little bit of a step up from the previous game. 
Control-wise, it feels great and has that distinct NES Castlevania feel. There is also a handy password feature which makes the game just a little bit more enjoyable. Also in 1991, Castlevania entered the 16-bit dimension with Super Castlevania 4 on the Super Nintendo. Released just a few months after the debut of the extremely sexy, very nice, Super Nintendo, the game puts on an audio-visual clinic with its Mode 7 backgrounds and fast and furious gameplay. As far as the story goes, this is essentially a remake of the original game with Dracula rising from his grave and you having to take him down. The game takes place across 11 levels instead of 6 as found in the original game. The first thing you notice upon starting up the game are the large and in charge detailed sprites in all the lovely colors. The levels are extremely detailed and are really just a means of showing off the Super Nintendo's Mode 7 hardware and they look absolutely stunning. A lot of the more innovative features of the third game such as branching paths and multiple characters are missing, with the game going back to its roots found in the original game. The designer of the game, Masahiro Yuno, had wanted to include these options in the game but did not have enough time to implement them. Thankfully, the password function still remains. The music and sound effects are like melted butter, nice and smooth on your eardrums. It creates a perfect atmosphere and should be experienced just for the audio alone. The controls are a little bit different with Simon being able to whip in all directions which really comes in handy. You can also attach your whip and swing across chasms similar to Indiana Jones. This is an excellent entry into the series, especially considering it was the very first one of the 16-bit era. In 1993, for the X68000 computer line, Akumaho Dracula was released. The game at its core is the original Castlevania, only redesigned to take full advantage of the more powerful CD-ROM based hardware. There are 8 levels in total with some familiar stages, but a lot of them have been redesigned. Every sub-weapon from the original game is made available, but there is one brand new one, which is an herb that can refill your health meter with 6 blocks used. The gameplay is very similar to the original NES version, although this time you can actually control Simon in mid-jump. The X68000, for those of you who don't know, was known for having very faithful arcade ports, and it uses this hardware to really make the game shine. While it doesn't use the gimmicky special effects of the Super Nintendo hardware, it does feature excellent animation and some of the best pixel artwork around. It also includes a new intro and ending. Some of the music tracks have been reused such as Vampire Killer, 
but everything has a symphonic feel thanks to the CD-ROM format. It is definitely a treat for your ears and if you are a Castlevania fan you should seek it out just to experience it for yourself. When I first started dabbling in emulators this was the game people would talk about and how much better it was than any other version of Castlevania on the market. The problem was every X68000 emulator was in Japanese and was very difficult to use. Thankfully the game was released as part of the Castlevania Chronicles here in the States with a number of brand new features. Not only do you get the original mode but also an arranged mode, new CGI movies, redesigned character sprites and more. There were also multiple difficulty levels which gives the little bitty babies a fighting chance at taking down Count Dracula. One thing of note that when you fight on the clock tower level in the original X68000 version, it would be synced up with the internal clock of the machine to show the proper time. Since the PlayStation does not have an internal clock, you can change this by entering the Konami code and accessing a hidden menu. A neat little feature to be sure. Also released in 1993 for the PC Engine Super CD format was Dracula X Rondo of Blood. At the time of this game's release, most CD-ROM based titles were essentially standard games with added audio and cutscenes, but this one takes it to a whole new level. You take on the role of Richter Belmont who has to rescue his significant other Annette who has been kidnapped by Dracula. This was the first Castlevania game to encourage exploring along with branching paths. There are 8 levels in total which does not sound like a lot but each stage has at least one branching path which if you manage to find them all brings the total up to 13. Dracula has also kidnapped 4 maidens and if you want to see the best ending in the game you have to rescue all 4 of them. Your primary weapon once again is the whip and you have 6 sub items to use this time around including all of the previous ones as well as a bible which will throw pages at the enemy. Another new feature is the item crash which are super attacks for each of your weapons that use a handful of hearts at once and unleash a flurry of items for several seconds. The graphics and animation are very good with extremely detailed backgrounds and loads of special effects. The bosses themselves are sometimes four or five times larger than your character and look fantastic. Thanks to the increased storage space of the CD-ROM, a lot of different enemy types appear with some of them only showing up once or twice throughout the whole game. The game has a definite anime feel more than a gothic old school monster flick vibe as found in the original game. This is also evident in the game's soundtrack which is not quite as dark and gothic as previous ones. It still sounds great but more in line with anime at the time. The gameplay is typical Castlevania 1 fare which means the directional whipping is gone but you do get a very cool backflip maneuver. The whip itself is also fully powered up from the get go. You can also play as Maria Renard after you rescue her and she will join you in your supernatural fight. Since she is smaller she is much more nimble and has different attacks as well. Playing through the game as Maria is essentially playing through on easy mode which is great for new players of the series. US audiences finally got a chance to play this game when it was released for the PSP in 2007 as part of the Castlevania X Chronicles.
Hello everybody and welcome back to part two of the history of Castlevania. The response to part one has been overwhelmingly positive except for one thing. My pronunciation of the word Akumajo. Now I did my due diligence like any self-respecting YouTuber should to learn the proper way to say the word. But apparently it was as wrong as a goat with two buttholes. So let's take a moment to learn the proper pronunciation. Akumajo. 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 And now I am quite the expert on the proper pronunciation. Thank you, YouTube. Now on with the show. Konami decided to use some of that patented Sega Blast processing power and brought Castlevania Bloodlines to the Sega Genesis. As the story goes, Count Dracula finally gets to take some well-deserved R&R. The Count's niece, Elizabeth Bartley, suddenly appears in the 20th century to wreak havoc. She orchestrates the beginning of World War I in order to fully resurrect her uncle. The main character that you play as is John Morris, who is the son of Quincy Morris. Quincy was killed at the end of the original Dracula novel, which for the first time, this Castlevania game tries to tie itself into the mythology of the book. We learn throughout the game that the Morris lineage are descendants of the Belmonts. Therefore, it's up to you and your best friend Eric Lacard to stop the Prince of Darkness himself. Speaking of Eric, Apparently, a vampire killed his girlfriend and he wants revenge. John has a standard whip that can be upgraded and can also cling to any ceiling to swing across pits. Eric has a spear which feels like it has a lot of weight behind it when using. This can also be upgraded with the most powerful being multiple blades at the end of the spear. There are also spots where you have to use Eric and his spear as a pole vault to access certain areas which is a nice touch. It is nice to have a different character to play as with completely different mechanics, but for me personally, I always preferred the whip. That's what she said! <laughs> the gameplay is pure Castlevania and Konami have outdone themselves once again. We get a few remade stages from previous Castlevania games, but the Genesis hardware is working overtime to provide some magical special effects and visual trickery. A lot of these were commonplace on the Super NES due to the Mode 7 hardware, but not so much on Sega's 16-bit machine. You will encounter rotating stages, giant multi-jointed boss characters, impressive water effects, and more. It's something you have to experience for yourself to truly appreciate. The music itself is also fantastic, being composed by Michiru Yamani who has quite the knack for getting the most out of Sega's audio hardware. One more thing to mention is, at the time, this was by far one of the most gore-filled Castlevania games on the market. From the title screen, which features bones soaking in a pool of blood, to killing zombies and watching their torsos rip apart. Even when you play as Eric and he dies, his spear is hurled up in the air and comes down impaling him. Keep in mind that any depiction of blood and gore were removed from the European release, and that included the name change from Bloodlines to the new generation. The game itself also has multiple difficulties with easy mode removing certain stages and boss fights. There are also multiple endings depending on which difficulty you play on. In 1995, Castlevania Dracula X was released for the Super Nintendo. Apparently, Konami ran out of ideas for names and decided to use Dracula X even though it was already used for the PC Engine version. While initially many people thought this was just a port of the PC Engine version, it is a brand new game that uses the same characters and controls. Similar to Konami's Castlevania 3 on the NES, 
They decided to throw everything they could into it, but due to the limited cartridge size, they were not quite as successful. You only get to play as Richter Belmont, with Maria being in the game as a character you have to find and rescue. Annette is also another character that has to be found, but the other two characters are not even included in the game. There are 9 levels in total, which is a step back from the 13 found in the PC Engine version. The gameplay is very similar and feels through and through like a traditional Castlevania game. You have your standard whip and also the various sub-weapons just like in the previous games. The backgrounds are nicely detailed with plenty of Mode 7 trickery that are a joy to behold. The sprites are large and well animated and everything has a certain weight about them. The boss fights feature giant sprites although not quite as big as the multi-jointed ones found in Castlevania Bloodlines for the Genesis. The music and sound effects are excellent, putting the Super Nintendo hardware through its paces. While obviously not quite as good as the PC Engine Super CD version, it is still really well done. Obviously the anime cutscenes had to go, but there is a nice intro and ending sequence. There is also a handy password feature. It's hard not to compare this to the original PC Engine version, and if you do, you will be disappointed. As a standalone Castlevania game on a cartridge format, it's really good, although not quite the masterpiece as previous entries. Fear has no form. Fear has no name. But now, fear has an address. Castlevania Symphony of the Night for the PlayStation from Konami. In 1997, the 32-bit era of 3D graphics were among us. Certain people absolutely loved the downright sexy polygons and turned their nose down at traditional 2D sprite-based games. Konami wasn't having any of this and decided to release Castlevania Symphony of the Night on the original PlayStation. They decided to go with the action slash RPG hybrid as found in Castlevania 2. This was dubbed Metroidvania by the press which is easily recognizable due to the very similar format found in both games. The game itself is open-ended although some doors are not accessible from the beginning meaning you have to backtrack after gaining certain powers or items to proceed. As the storyline goes, this is a direct sequel to Dracula X for the PC Engine, with the game starting out just before the climactic battle with Dracula. Using Richter Belmont, you once again defeat Dracula and all is well. The storyline fast forwards five years and Alucard, the son of Dracula, awakens from his slumber and has noticed that the demon castle has reappeared. At this time, Richter Belmont has also disappeared. You take on the role of Alucard who has to explore dear old dad's castle to find a mysterious entity who is controlling Richter Belmont who proclaims to be the lord of the castle. The controls in the game are top notch with your starting weapon being a sword instead of a whip. The animation is extremely smooth and detailed and so are the backgrounds. The standard sub weapons also make a return but there are new ones as well including holy ashes which are similar to holy water, lightning and crystals which shoots all over the screen among others. Added to your arsenal is a nice double jump as well as the ability to transform into three different entities including a bat which lets you fly, a wolf which lets you run really fast, and a mist which will let you squeeze into tight spaces in the walls. Your character also has a number of magic spells which will drain on a separate magic meter. The more enemies you kill, the more experience points you receive which results in you leveling up. Your character also has four attributes which include strength, defense, intelligence, and luck. There are also a wide variety of weapons to assist you in your quest. During the game your character can acquire the ability to summon familiars which are entities that aid you in the battle and exploration. The goal of the game is to search for Dracula's body parts and bring them back to the castle for the epic final showdown 
which is exactly what you had to do in the second game in the series on the NES. After beating the game, you do have the option of playing through as Richter Belmont, but the storyline stays the same. Did I mention how absolutely fantastic the graphics were? This is without a doubt one of the best versions of Castlevania on the market, and here we are 23 years later and still holding it in such high regard. There are literally over 100 different types of enemies to face along the way, with some massive end level bosses, some of which take up multiple screens. The music is something else entirely and was composed by Michiru Yamani, who had done a phenomenal job on Castlevania Bloodlines for the Sega Genesis. I can't say it enough that the music is phenomenal and any self-respecting fan of Castlevania should definitely check it out. Now even though as a Castlevania purist I prefer the whip, but the switch to the sword is a nice change of pace. As I mentioned, this is one of the best versions of Castlevania on the market and if you've never had a chance to try it out, pop that bad boy in and give it a shot. There was a version released for the Sega Saturn which is not quite as good, as well as numerous re-releases over the years on Xbox Live and the PlayStation Network. A version for the iOS and Android platforms were released in 2020. If your eyes had melted from all the glorious colors of Symphony of the Night, then perhaps you should have checked out 1998's Castlevania Legends for the original Game Boy. This is the third and final entry on the original Game Boy, in which you take on the role of Sonya Belmont, the first vampire hunter in her clan to take down Dracula during the Middle Ages. She does move just a little bit faster and is a little bit more nimble than the main characters in the previous game. She can also crouch and move which is a new feature and control her jump in mid-air. Instead of the traditional sub-weapons, your character receives soul powers at the end of each level and can be switched between at any time. Some of the soul powers allow you to freeze your enemies, heal yourself, and shoot out energy among others. If you press the A and B button together, you'll activate burning mode which temporarily makes you invincible and increases your speed. This does use up some of your life gauge, so use it wisely. There are six stages in total with an extra one being hidden. The graphics are adequate, but don't really pop off the screen like other Castlevania adventures. The music is average at best, which is unfortunate because it is such a big part of the gameplay experience. Chronologically, this was supposed to be the first in the series showing the origin of the Belmonts vs. Count Dracula. Longtime Castlevania producer Koji Igarashi would go on to call this game an embarrassment and would also have it removed from the timeline saying that it conflicted with the main plot of the original game. In 1999, after much resistance, Castlevania finally entered the third dimension with its release on the Nintendo 64. When the title officially made its debut at the Tokyo Game Show in 1997, it was initially called Castlevania 64, but was later changed to just Castlevania. You get your choice of two characters, the first one being Reinhard Schneider who is a whip-wielding son of a gun, or you can play as Carrie Fernandez who uses magic as her primary weapon. As the story goes, it is 1852 and Dracula has awoken from his 100 year sleepover. The two young heroes have sensed his return and set out on a quest to Transylvania to vanquish the evil Count once and for all. Reinhard Schneider is actually a descendant of the Belmont clan. Each character has their own strengths and weaknesses, with Reinhardt's whip being strong but slow. K 
Carrie's use of attacks includes flying magical balls which can be charged up. Both characters still use the standard sub weapons which are powered by gems instead of hearts. The gameplay is similar to Symphony of the Night which means it's a standard action RPG. As far as the controls go, it uses an auto lock system which for the most part works okay. When it comes to the platforming sections, and there are quite a few of these, it gets a little more clumsy but as long as you are holding the button as you jump you can grab onto the platform and pull yourself up. It's by no means perfect but it does help. The game takes place across 10 levels ranging from the Transylvania Forest to Dracula's Castle. The game is partially open-ended meaning you have to search around, pulling switches and finding keys to exit the level. You will encounter some unusual bosses including a chainsaw wielding gardener and his demonic dogs. There are also elements of the survival horror genre where you are placed in situations of stress, vulnerability and anxiety gameplay elements that are unusual in the world of Castlevania. It's possible to be trapped in cage fights with monsters or crushed by a giant ceiling if you don't defeat your enemy in enough time. Another one has you in the Villa Maze Garden where you have to escape the labyrinth while enemies are chasing you down. There is a night and day cycle but the only difference is that certain doors become unlocked at night. This also affects when characters will talk to you as they will only speak to you at certain parts of the day. Also, if you take longer than 16 days to complete the game, you will get the bad ending in which Dracula prevails. Thankfully, there is multiple save points throughout the game. The bosses are absolutely huge and they look really good. The graphics are simply adequate for an early 3D polygon based game. It has a lot of the usual Nintendo 64 trappings such as fog and pop-in, which Castlevania apologists always defend as adding to the atmosphere. Personally, I think it looks terrible and I always have even when I first played it 20 years ago. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Some games are meant for 2D sprite-based gameplay and in my opinion this is one of them. I applaud Konami's efforts but in my opinion they just didn't pull it off. The camera is another problem which again also plagued other early 3D games. It tends to have a mind of its own especially when fighting the bosses. The music as well thanks to the cartridge format is not as good as the previous entries including Symphony of the Night. What is there is pretty good but there just isn't much of it. Some levels are played in almost complete silence and others the soundtrack is very muted making it hard to hear. As I mentioned throughout this video, music is an important part in a Castlevania game. If it's not done correctly then you lose something in the overall experience. Late 1999, Castlevania Legacy of Darkness was released for the Nintendo 64. This is more of a director's cut of the original Castlevania and not an outright sequel. This is a remake of the original game featuring improved graphics, new levels and new villains. In this game you take on the role of Cornell, a powerful werewolf who is seeking out the evil demons who are responsible for his sister's disappearance. Cornell has upgradable weapons with three different levels of strength. The game is a prequel to the original Castlevania on the Nintendo 64 with more emphasis on platforming and puzzle solving. You also have new bosses and plot twists to contend with as well. Once you play through as Cornell you can unlock Carrie and Reinhardt side quests. The game does make use of the Nintendo 64's expansion pack add-on which allows for the use of high res textures. While the high res textures makes the game look better the frame rate does suffer a bit because of it. Similar to the first game, what is there of the music is good but there's just not much to it. 
there are some nice unlockables such as bonus costumes. Both Nintendo 64 games have had their spot removed on the Castlevania timeline. According to director Koji Igarashi, they were removed because they were considered side projects and not part of the official storyline. In 2001, Nintendo released the Game Boy Advance. This was the follow-up to the extremely successful Game Boy, which essentially gave you the power of a Super Nintendo right in the palm of your hands. One of the early titles for the system was Castlevania Circle of the Moon, a return to its 2D sprite-based roots in non-linear fashion. While the Game Boy Advance was much more powerful than the standard Game Boy, it still didn't have a backlit screen, so with Castlevania's visuals already being a bit on the murky side, it made seeing everything all the more difficult, unless of course you purchased a third-party add-on light. Thanks to the release of the Game Boy Advance SP, which added a built-in backlight, and eventually emulation, the gameplay experience is a whole lot better and a whole lot brighter. The story takes place in 1830 in which you as Nathan Graves, who along with his friend Hugh Baldwin, are sent into Dracula's castle to stop Carmella from resurrecting him. Your primary weapon is the whip, along with your standard set of sub-weapons as found in previous games, only one of which can be carried at any given time. The gameplay itself is a perfect marriage of non-linear exploration and straight-up action. There are certain parts of the game where abilities have to be unlocked before you can advance such as double jump, wall kick, and being able to run. The graphics are nice, although a bit uninspired at times, but there are a lot more platforming elements to liven things up. The game does incorporate RPG elements such as hit points, the amount of damage you can sustain, magic points, and so on. The more enemies you defeat, the more items and XP you will gain until your character eventually levels up. After you defeat boss characters, you will gain certain power-ups and abilities. Something else that is new is the DSS or Dual Setup System, which are magic cards that fall into one or two categories of action and attributes. You take one card from each category and combine them with a total of 100 possible combinations. By combining these cards, you equip your character with new weapons such as dropping the whip for a sword or a hammer. Some will actually increase your overall stats and others will provide elemental shields, projectiles, explosives, etc. You can only equip these items one at a time though. What makes the game so difficult is that certain monsters will drop these cards and it's unbeknownst to you which ones will do so. Also included in the game is the Battle Arena which features much more difficult monsters to defeat but also has some brand new unlockables. The music itself is good although not quite up there with the Super Nintendo standard. Overall though, it's a great little addition to the Castlevania series, especially in the palm of your hands. Castlevania fans who were clamoring for the X68000 version but never had a chance to try it here in the States finally got their wish in 2001 when Konami released Castlevania Chronicles for the PlayStation 1. This is essentially a port of that version which is a remake of the original Castlevania for the NES. What this means is that a lot of the extras such as multiple player characters, alternate levels, and animated cutscenes were not included in the game. Even though it goes back to the basics, it still feels like Castlevania through and through. 
Instead of six levels, the game takes place across eight, with certain levels being expanded upon. The sub weapons are essentially the same, but you do have a healing herb which can replenish your health at any given time. Some of the boss fights have also been changed, making them much more difficult. The graphics themselves are absolutely fantastic with nice, smooth animation and exceptional background detail. The music is fantastic with Vampire Killer and Wicked Child being totally redone and sounding great. Among the other added features are an arrange mode with redone sprites and new designs. It also features fancier explosions, brand new CGI intro and ending movies, but honestly they don't really fit into the overall aesthetic of the game. There is also a new soundtrack arrangement which sounds good, but personally I prefer the original. The arrange mode also includes multiple difficulty levels. This is definitely one to play, especially if you are a fan of the original Castlevania game. And 2003 released for the Game Boy Advance was Castlevania Harmony of Dissonance. This was produced by Koji Igarashi who was co-producer on Symphony of the Night. One of the big complaints from Circle of the Moon on the Game Boy Advance was the visuals were too dark and murky. Konami decided to crank those visuals up to 11. The last time my eyeballs melted like this, I walked into my ex-girlfriend who was taking a shower. Now I never had a problem with the original visuals because I always used a good third party light, but I can understand the complaints from other people. Again with the advancement of backlit technology and emulation, it's no longer a problem. The game takes place 50 years after Simon Belmont as Vanquished Dracula. The story revolves around Juiced Belmont, the first time a Belmont has starred in a Castlevania game since Dracula X. He has to rescue his childhood friend, Liddy Erlanger, from the dastardly clutches of the nefarious Count Dracula. The gameplay is typical Castlevania fare with you brandishing your whip and it feels fantastic. The sub-weapons are also back, but this time they can be combined with five different spellbooks including Fire, Ice, Bolt, Wind, and the Summoning. If you manage to use one of these books, you are invincible for a short period of time. Another new addition is the dash move, which can be activated by pressing L and R and gives you a short burst of speed, which is really helpful for dealing with the onslaught of enemies. The role-playing element makes its return with your character increasing his stats with the more enemies you kill. There are basically two castles in the game, Castle A and Castle B, which have different enemy types and placements, weapons, and other aspects. It is possible to locate special warp rooms which will transport you between the two. The graphics are nice and detailed with plenty of colors to boot. The sprites are well animated and there is a nice variety of enemies although not quite as diverse as Symphony of the Night. The bosses are large, segmented creatures using various scaling and rotation effects. The sound effects and music are unfortunately simply adequate. While they get the job done, it's simply meh in my opinion. There are a few unlockables such as a boss rush mode and also characters for you to play as once you complete the game. This is an excellent follow-up to Circle of the Moon and a worthy addition to the Castlevania franchise, but the best was yet to come. And 2003, also for the Game Boy Advance, was Castlevania Area of Sorrow. When it came time to replicating the look and feel of Symphony of the Night in the palm of your hand, 
The third time must have been the charm because this one comes the closest to pulling it off. As the story goes, Dracula was defeated in the year 1999 and his powers were imprisoned in a solar eclipse. After his death, a prophecy was revealed that he would be reincarnated in his castle in the year 2035. You take on the role of Soma Cruz, who is an exchange student living in Japan who has to tackle the evil forces of Count Dracula. There are plenty of supporting characters to aid you in your quest as well. The gameplay is very similar to Symphony of the Night with Soma controlling very similar to Alucard using a sword instead of a whip. There are other standard weapons available as well, including hammers, although powerful, they are slow. All the abilities from symphonies such as sub-weapons, familiars, spells, and so forth are either reduced in power or missing entirely. In its place is something called the Tactical Soul System in which each enemy in the castle has a soul which can be randomly stolen after its defeat. Upon its defeat, you gain some sort of ability. For example, the skeletons will let you throw bones, zombies will let you throw grenades, and Legion will let you shoot out a trio of lasers using a spaceship of all things, similar to Konami's other franchise, Gradius. I prefer the standard sub-weapons, but I applaud their effort for wanting to freshen up the series with something just a little bit different. The only problem is that you have to do a bit of grinding and kill the same enemies over and over, which does get a bit tedious. The magic meter will automatically regenerate now, but it's very slow and can be replenished more quickly with hearts. The graphics are nicely detailed with smooth animation and excellent character designs. Similar to the last game, the bosses are huge with multi-jointed sprites which involves plenty of scaling and rotation. The last boss in particular is amazing to see. The music is fantastic and is a step up from the previous game with more resources being devoted to the audio this time around than the previous game. In 2003, Konami decided to dip its toes into the world of 3D once again with Castlevania Lament of Innocence. For the first time, the game takes place during 1094, exploring the origins of the Belmont and Dracula feud. The series focuses on Leon Belmont, who has to rescue his significant other, Sarah. You will encounter plenty of other characters, and the storyline has lots of twists and turns. The storyline also explains the origins of the vampire Killer Whip and Count Dracula. This was the first game to be released exclusively on the PlayStation 2 and overall they've done a pretty good job. The game runs at a silky smooth 60 frames per second and your character controls as smooth as melted butter. You can dodge, block, and double jump. There are two different whip attacks, including a short, straight, less powerful one, and also a slow, more powerful, circular one, allowing you to string together combos. The whip can also be used to latch onto the ceiling and pull yourself up. You can acquire three more whips, which are guarded by three elemental bosses, fire, ice, and lightning. Exploring the castle is open-ended with plenty of puzzles to solve and plenty of hidden items to discover. At the start of the game is a portal with access to the five main areas. After you defeat the boss of each area, the final area becomes unlocked. There are various shops throughout the game which you can purchase upgrades to your stats and equipment. The sub-weapon system was taken almost verbatim from Harmony of Dissonance in which you can combine them with one of seven colored orbs, which are found after beating the stages. The RPG elements have been scaled back a bit, but they are still there to a degree. There are a few characters that you can play as once you complete the game, including a vampire and a little guy with a pumpkin head. The game puts to good use the PlayStation 2's powerful hardware with fantastic visuals and special effects. 
the characters and enemies are varied and well animated. The camera works really well this time around and although there is no manual setting it's not really required. The music is head and shoulders above anything since Symphony of the Night and is almost as good. If you are a Castlevania fan it's something you need to experience for yourself. While the game isn't perfect, it is pretty darn good, especially for a 3D attempt at a classic franchise. brought us Castlevania Dawn of Sorrow for the Nintendo DS. This was the first entry on the dual screen handheld and is a direct sequel to Area of Sorrow with the same cast of characters. The game takes place a year after the last one with Soma coming under attack by a cult leader named Celia, who is once again seeking the power of Count Dracula. She has two associates that were both born on the day that Dracula died and are open to receiving his powers. Soma sets out to the castle to right the wrongs and keep Dracula buried forever. There are various weapon choices this time around including axes, swords, spears, handguns and grenades with each one differing in their damage output. The tactical soul system makes its return but it works just a little bit differently this time around. The same soul can be multiplied which allows its strength to increase. Souls are divided into four categories including bullets, enchant, guardian, and ability, but you can only have one equipped at one time. If you manage to receive the doppelganger soul you can have two different weapons and soul settings. You can also exchange souls and forge new weapons, but it does require a lot more grinding. Thanks to the increased capabilities of the Nintendo DS, you can trade souls via Wi-Fi with other players in your area. Also, the dual screen is put to great use with something called a magic seal. Once the player reduces the hit points of an enemy, the player must draw certain symbols on the touchscreen. The further into the game you get, the more complex and detailed the designs that you have to draw become. The graphics are absolutely phenomenal and come very close to replicating the look and feel of Symphony of the Night. The sprites are large and detailed with beautiful animation. The backgrounds themselves are extremely detailed and some even feature polygonal parts. For a cartridge system, the music is spectacular with a wide variety of music available. Once again, the bosses are absolutely massive with them generally taking up the entire screen. The game does have an excellent post-game ending depending on if you get the good ending or the bad ending. It's very detailed and has a nice twist so I won't spoil it here. Overall though, it's an excellent first version for Nintendo's dual screen handheld. In 2005, Konami released Castlevania Curse of Darkness for the PlayStation 2 and the original Xbox. There were definitely a few growing pains translating the original 2D Castlevania onto a 3D platform, but the previous effort wasn't bad in my opinion. As the story goes, the game takes place in 1479, three years after the events of Castlevania 3 on the NES. Now even though Dracula was defeated at the hands of Trevor Belmont, his curse is still felt all throughout Europe with disease and famine spreading rapidly. You take on the role of Hector, a character who had served the Count of Darkness, leaves Dracula's castle and relinquishes his power living among humans. Hector's wife Rosalie is accused of witchcraft and is burned at the stake. 
Hector vows revenge on an old rival who had started the accusations on his beloved Rosalie. Hector is not a member of the Belmont clan, therefore he does not brandish the vampire killer whip. Instead though, he has the option of using various weapons throughout the game such as swords, axes, brass knuckles, and spears with each weapon having its own different types of combos. The action itself is much better balanced this time around and the combos seem to flow much better. Also new to the combat system are familiars known as innocent devils. The Fairy Devil includes healing. The Bird Devil allows swarms of creatures to attack your enemy. Battle type, which is very strong, and there are also a few others as well. Each of the Devils can level up independently of Hector and evolve differently. Speaking of leveling up, the RPG elements from the previous games have been restored so you finally have a reason to kill every enemy you see. The characters and animation are nice and smooth, but the backgrounds leave much to be desired. There are times you'll get lost in the castle just because the rooms all look so similar. Some of the rooms are extremely barren with only a couple of candles to destroy in each one. The automatic camera which worked so well in the last game has been replaced by a manual camera which, surprise, 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 doesn't work as good as it should. The music itself is a bright spot on this rather average game, so at least there is that. Throughout the game, you will discover chairs hidden throughout the land. It's even more bizarre once you find the chair room in which everyone you've discovered has been placed. After you complete the game, it is possible to play through it again as Richter Belmont brandishing the vampire killer whip. In 2006, released for the Nintendo DS was Castlevania Portrait of Ruin. This is a continuation of the story from Castlevania Bloodlines on the Sega Genesis. The game takes place in 1944 during World War II in Europe. You take on the role of Jonathan Morris, who is the son of John, and his companion Charlotte as they attempt to take down the evil vampire Brawner and his two demonic daughters. This was the first game that allowed you to play as two different characters, each one with different attributes. Jonathan has the Vampire Killer, but since he is not a true Belmont, he cannot use it properly. But there are other weapons to be found. Charlotte uses magical attacks, with her main weapon being a book filled with spirits. The sub-weapons also make their return with boomerangs, daggers, axes, and grenades among others. Instead of the sub-weapons, Charlotte can equip sub-spells which include fire and ice and boosting your stats. You can switch between your characters at any time as they both share the same life bar. It is possible to have both characters on the screen at the same time with the other characters shadowing the movements of the original. There are various puzzles throughout the game which sees you having to use both characters to solve them. The locales you visit are extremely varied with the main hub this time being a hall full of paintings. Once you access these paintings you are transported to Egypt, a forest, the foggy streets of London, and a mansion. There is also a level called the Nation of Fools which is a combination of an upside down castle and a funhouse. The backgrounds are detailed but they tend to get repetitive. The sprites and animation are well defined and extremely smooth. Thanks to the varied locations you visit, there are 155 different enemy types you will encounter. The bosses reflect this once again with giant segmented pieces with a lot of them using scaling and rotation. There are four different single player modes for the main story and a boss rush mode which can be played with either one or two players. Alternate endings are also included. This was the first Castlevania game to offer cooperative multiplayer over either local Wi-Fi or Nintendo's Wi-Fi. The music is really good and for the first time on a handheld, English voiceovers are provided. 
The Japanese voices are still in the game and can be unlocked as an Easter egg. Two thousand seven brought us the release of Castlevania: The Dracula X Chronicles on the PSP. English fans of the series who had always read about how great Rondo of Blood was on the PC Engine finally got a chance to check it out for themselves. The game comes with both the emulated version from the PC Engine as well as a brand new two point five D version, complete with brand new updated graphics. When the game was first released, a lot of people had a problem with the updated look. As you know, I am a sprite purist, but I think it looks fantastic. The attention to detail is second to none, especially in the backgrounds. Some of the other complaints included blurry textures, but to be honest, I never noticed it even back in the day. The game runs at a rock solid 30 frames per second, and due to the PSP screen size, it now runs at 16x9 instead of 4x3. There are a couple of extra levels in the updated version as well. There are bonus items to locate, including a sound edit bonus which allows you to use either the original PC Engine music or the brand new rearrangement. One other complaint of the original game was that the final boss was just way too easy. In the original game, the only thing you received if you saved all of the maidens was an extra cutscene. In the remake though, it's just a little bit different. If you manage to save all of the maidens, a third, much more difficult boss will appear. It's not all gravy though, as the endings are completely different now for some reason. Symphony of the Night is also included as an unlockable extra. In my opinion, Konami did a fantastic job with this version. I think it's the perfect blend of standard 2D sprite based classic gaming and 3D polygons. In 2008, Castlevania Order of Ecclesia was released for the Nintendo DS. This would be the last Castlevania game for the system, and despite it being extremely difficult, it's still one of the best for the unit. As the story goes, the game takes place in the late 1800s sometime after Symphony of the Night. Dracula has been vanquished, and the Belmont clan has disappeared. Various splinter groups have been assembled to create countermeasures for Dracula's eventual return. One of these organizations is called the Order of Ecclesia, and its leader, as chosen by its member, is a woman by the name of Shinoa. This is the first time you get to take on the role of a female as the lead character since the game Castlevania Legends, in which you got to play as Sonya Belmont. Shinoa has the ability to absorb magical powers called glyphs. Right after Shinoa uses the powerful Dominus glyph, Dracula is vanquished temporarily. A mysterious character by the name of Albus rises up and steals the powerful glyph. There are plot twists amundo, so I won't spoil it here. Using a similar card system from Circle of the Moon, certain enemies will drop glyphs. These icons can be equipped to your back or arms, allowing you to perform powerful attacks. There are over 100 different glyphs that you can pick up. They do use something called magic points, but once the gauge is depleted, you have to wait for it to recharge. Weak attacks such as a sword doesn't use as much MP, but the more powerful ones can only be used a couple of times before your bar has to regenerate. There is also something called the Glyph Union, which features the most powerful attack in the game, but it depletes your hearts when using it. You can also combine two glyphs at once for some nice dual wielding action. While doing this, 
If you tap the buttons back and forth with the proper rhythm, you will unleash an extremely powerful series of combos which do not take any time to regenerate. The layout of the game is similar to Simon's Quest on the NES. This is actually the first Metroidvania game to allow you to explore areas outside of the castle. You can only proceed to a new area after completing the task in the one you are currently in. There are also various side quests you can complete in the game. The graphics are probably the best I've seen since Symphony of the Night. The animation is nice and smooth and the character sprites are colorful and detailed. The backgrounds feature some of the best pixel art on the system and are extremely detailed. One of the coolest aspects of the games are the various bosses that you fight. All of them are completely new with none of them being recycled from old games with the exception being Death and Dracula. Some of the bosses you will encounter include a giant crab near a lighthouse, a gigantic wolf shadow, and also a giant centaur creature which takes up one fourth of the screen. These are very difficult and will take you out in three or four hits until you learn the patterns. The music is a bit different from previous games, almost sounding a bit mature and refined although still catchy. Upon completing the game, there is a boss rush mode as well as being able to play on a harder difficulty. You can also play as Albus who uses guns as his primary weapon. You can also unlock additional content after being linked up with Castlevania Judgment on the Nintendo Wii, which I will talk about later in the series. Overall, it's an excellent game with great playability. In 2010, Castlevania The Adventure Rebirth was released as a digital-only WiiWare release. This was developed by M2 and is created in the style of the original NES games. The story is not very elaborate with you having to defeat Dracula and all of his minions. The game is sort of patterned after the Game Boy title The Castlevania Adventure with some of the same enemies and also the ability to transform your vampire killer into one that shoots flames. The game takes place across six levels with a brand new boss to fight at the end of each one. The gameplay feels like the original Castlevania with nice tight controls. One change in the controls is the ability to change directions in mid-jump. They have also included branching paths which if used properly let you bypass mid-level bosses. The animation and pixel work is absolutely classic Castlevania with the quality being just above the 16-bit Super Nintendo. The level design is really well done, but the only problem is they all sort of blend together and do tend to get a bit boring. The music though was fantastic being composed by Manubu Namiki. He designed these tunes in the late 80s to 90s Konami style. There are multiple difficulties, although to encounter the true final boss, you have to play it on the harder difficulty. There is no password or save system, although you can input a code to unlock a level select. Overall, the game is geared toward the casual player and any Castlevania fan will enjoy it. On the surface, it's fun to play with, but on the inside, it lacks depth. Similar to my ex-girlfriend. Twenty Eleven brought us Castlevania Lords of Shadow for the Xbox 360, PS3, and a few years later for the PC. This is a complete reboot of the series which takes place in Southern Europe during the Middle Ages. You take on the role of Gabriel Belmont, a knight who was part of the Holy Brotherhood of Light whose clan is charged with protecting people from demons. 
Gabriel's wife Marie is murdered, but due to the various dark entities enveloping the world, her soul lies between life and death. He learns of an artifact called the God Mask, which can resurrect the dead, but it's been shattered and has been spread across the territory. You have to set out on a quest to retrieve each of the pieces, rescue Marie's soul, and save humanity. Instead of the Vampire Killer, you wield the Combat Cross, which has a retractable chain and the ability to unlock 40 different combos. Direct attacks to single enemies are more powerful, however, when surrounded by enemies, it switches to a weaker attack. Your whip can also interact with sub-weapons such as holy water and knives. One new sub-weapon are the fairies which will distract enemies and also a dark crystal which must be assembled by obtaining rare pieces of it. Once completed, it will call upon a demon to attack all nearby enemies. Speaking of enemies, there are various brand new ones in this game, plus you have the ability to tame certain ones such as spiders and trolls which you have to ride to get past certain obstacles. The gameplay was dubbed a cinematic action platformer which plays very similar to God of War and Uncharted. You can unlock new moves and attacks by spending your well-earned XP points. Although the gameplay is similar to God of War, you have to use a bit more skill while playing. For example, if you kill enemies without taking damage, it will increase your combo meter. There is also a counter attack meter which will block an enemy's attack. Use this at the right time and it will immediately max out the combo gauge. The platforming feels very much like Uncharted, but this time you use your whip as a grappling hook. There are lots of puzzles to solve in the game and some of them are a bit difficult. Various sections including some of the boss fights include quick time events. The graphics are absolutely phenomenal, especially the bosses. They are giant and take over multiple screens in some cases. The only problem with these fantastic graphics are the performance issues as a lot of times it tends to cripple the system causing slowdown and choppy gameplay. The PC version which came out a few years later is much more smooth. The music has a western flair to it and doesn't sound like any previous Castlevania. While technically it's very good, it just doesn't have that gothic feel that I'm looking for when I'm playing these types of games. One cool aspect of the game is the narration of your compatriot Zobek, which was done by Patrick Stewart. Some might say it's a bit cheesy, but I always enjoyed them. There are 12 chapters in the game and 2 DLC chapters you can purchase. While the level designs are diverse, they are extremely long and tend to go on for hours at a time. While this doesn't feel like a Castlevania game aside from a guy brandishing a whip, it's still fun to play despite its flaws. In 2013, Castlevania Lords of Shadow Mirror of Fate was released for the Nintendo 3DS. You take on the role of four characters this time around. The prologue starts out with Gabriel. It then fast forwards several years to Simon Belmont. Simon is the son of Trevor who left on a crusade to invade Dracula's castle but never returned. Now fully grown, Simon follows in dear old dad's footsteps to take his revenge. He ends up being followed by a vampire who turns out to be Alucard. At this point, you take on the role of Alucard and follow his plotline. Eventually, the story will revert back to Trevor and reveals how their quest ties together. Rather than the third person perspective used in the original Lords of Shadow, a 2.5D perspective is used and looks really good. As soon as I started playing though, I had to stop and go visit my optometrist to purchase a new set of glasses because the viewpoint is zoomed way out.
It's a bit off-putting at first, but eventually you do get used to it. There are elements of Metroidvania thrown in. Once again, your primary weapon is the combat cross, with you having to string together combos while dodging and blocking enemy attacks. Taking out enemies in the same way gets a bit repetitive and honestly, after a few hours, tends to get boring. There are quick time events as well, which breaks up the monotony quite nicely. Killing enemies adds to your XP, which will slowly level up your player. This will give you the option of upgrading your whip, allowing you to kill the enemy slightly faster, but doesn't add any more techniques. Each character has two magical powers they can call upon. Simon uses the spirit of Belnadas to restore health and protect against acid waterfalls. The other magical spirit he can use is Reinhardt, who will shoot powerful arrows. Alucard can use the power of mist to heal himself or use the power of a werewolf. Trevor uses light and dark magic to restore health or improve attack power. Each character has two sub weapons such as axes, oil flasks, a stopwatch, boomerangs, and electric bombs. The only way to replenish the use of your sub weapons is to smash the barrels littered throughout the game which are filled with hearts. There are candles in the game, but unfortunately, whipping them does nothing. Speaking of the whip, all three characters use the combat cross as their primary weapon. As if this wasn't bad enough, they all have identical movesets. There are some nice platform elements in the game, which again feels like Uncharted more than classic Castlevania. There are very little hidden items to find and almost no alternate routes. As I mentioned, the graphics are very detailed with some of the best sprite work on the 3DS. The backgrounds in particular have a dark macabre look to them which makes it feel like classic Castlevania. The boss battles are fantastic with some really unique designs. The only downside is that the boss fights tend to take too long but they are rather easy. The frame rate on the other hand is absolutely terrible. The game will often stutter at the worst times, especially during combat. The controls are fairly good, although they do take a bit of getting used to. Every time you use your whip, you take a step forward, which makes it difficult to dodge projectiles. Thankfully, there are two checkpoints per level, which does help immensely. The music is pretty good with a nice gothic vibe, but nothing too memorable. Later in 2013, an HD version was released for PS3, Xbox 360, and Windows. The Windows version ran at a silky smooth 60 frames per second as opposed to 30 that all other versions ran at. brought us Castlevania Lords of Shadow 2 for the Xbox 360, PS3, and PC. During the epilogue, Gabriel has now been fully transformed into Dracula who awakens in the modern era. Gabriel is awoken from a long nap with no recollection of how he got there. The only thing he wants to do is die, but being immortal, he cannot. Zobek is in possession of the Vampire Killer, which is the only thing that can kill Dracula. Gabriel has to team up with his former enemy to take down an even larger threat, the big red dead Satan himself who is on the verge of resurrection and is looking to destroy the world. The game switches back to a third person perspective which features an open world instead of a chapter by chapter basis. Right off the bat, you'll notice that the camera has been totally redesigned and is now user controlled. Your main weapon is the Shadow Whip, which is pretty much equal in power to the Combat Cross. There are two new weapons this time around, each one having their own unique combo system. The Void Sword, which uses the power of ice to restore your health, and also the Chaos Claws, which can destroy shields. 
Your secondary attacks include bombs, daggers, distracting enemies with bats, and being able to turn into mist. You can also shapeshift into rats to hide from enemies, possessing enemies for a few seconds so you can pass through secure doors, and drinking blood of your enemies to partially replenish your health. It's good old fashioned family friendly entertainment. Other items you could find include a clock which will slow down time, the talisman of the dragon which transforms Dracula into his dragon form, and dodo eggs which will summon birds to hunt down secrets. One other notable change is the ability to disable quick time events for people that just don't really care for them. The graphics, while detailed and well animated, are extremely dark and are sometimes hard to see. The visuals actually look slightly worse than the first game for some odd reason, but the frame rate is more consistent. Once again, the PC version runs at 60 frames per second with much better graphics. The boss fights are again absolutely fantastic with you fighting a variety of new creatures such as the Toy Maker who inhabits a variety of mechanical puppets. Another aspect of the game is the stealth mode in which you have to distract enemies to sneak past them. This piece of the gameplay really doesn't fit into the Castlevania mold. The music is only meh in my opinion. It just sort of plays in the background with nothing really standing out or anything too memorable. The controls are nice and tight, but the problem is that the levels are extremely too long. Repetition and boredom is soon to set in, similar to when I asked my wife how her day was. I think the game clocks in at about 12 hours, which in my opinion is just way too long for a Castlevania game. There was one DLC story added entitled Revelation, which is a prequel to the main story featuring Gabriel. Happy little games. Hello my friends and welcome back to the fifth and final installment in the history of Castlevania. For anyone who was curious, the computer conversions of the original game are at the end of this video. Also, thank you all so much for leaving likes on my last video. It really helps with the Google Analytics and I really do appreciate it. Thank you. There were numerous spin-offs, with the earliest one being 1990's Kid Dracula, which was released only in Japan. It is considered a parody of the original Castlevania with similar gameplay. As the story goes, the self-proclaimed Demon King, or Kid Dracula, has awoken from his long slumber only to discover that the dinosaur Gallimoth has challenged him. Kid Dracula uses a little five-finger discount on his father's cape and sets out on a journey to destroy the monster and reclaim his throne. You will encounter various familiar enemies such as bats, knights, zombies, and Frankenstein's monster. The various levels include an underwater stage, an amusement park, pirate ships, on top of skyscrapers, and a moving train among others. Instead of a whip, you have what's called the Ball of Destruction. As you defeat the bosses throughout the game, you will gain more abilities. The graphics definitely have a super deformed style to them, with short squat sprites but minimal flicker, which is always a good thing on an 8-bit NES. The controls are pretty good, although not as tight as the original Castlevania. The game itself is very difficult, and if I had hair to spare, I would have been pulling it out while playing. There was a remake for the original Game Boy that was released in 1993. There was finally an English release as part of Konami's Castlevania Anniversary Collection, which was released in 2019 for the PS4, Xbox One, 
Nintendo Switch, and Windows. Castlevania Order of Shadows was released in 2007 for various mobile phones. The game features Desmond Belmont as he fights through Transylvania to defeat the evil Rohan Krauss who was attempting to resurrect Dracula. Thanks to the limited phone technology at the time, this is perhaps the worst Castlevania ever created. The controls, as you could rightly guess, are absolutely horrendous with you having to use the keypad. For example, you have to push up in order to jump forward. If you let go of up, he will immediately fall to the ground. It's also extremely difficult to climb stairs. Your primary weapon is the Vampire Killer Whip, but it's extremely slow and sluggish when using. Your character will actually pause for a few seconds when using the move, leaving you vulnerable to attacks. There are some light RPG elements with you gaining XP with the more enemies you kill. This will allow you to unlock various new whips. You can also find secondary weapons littered throughout the game. The graphics are fairly detailed, but the animation is slow and stiff. The music, while nothing phenomenal, is actually pretty good for a 2007 mobile game. Overall, even running it on an emulator, the game just wasn't very fun to play. Two thousand nine brought us the only disc release for the Nintendo Wii Castlevania Judgment. This is a one on one fighting game which features a roster of twelve characters across the entire Castlevania timeline. Some of the characters you get to play as include Alucard, Dracula, Death, Simon Belmont, Trevor Belmont, and Maria Renard. The game uses the Wiimote for its controls along with the nunchuck. The Wiimote is used for basic attacks and sub-weapons while the nunchuck is used to move your character around and also for defense. The game also supports the classic controller in addition to the GameCube controller, which does help immensely otherwise you can crack that whip. Each character does have his own set of attributes and weapons. The game takes place in a 3D environment similar to Power Stone. The character models are simply adequate with them not looking quite as good as other fighters released at the same time. The same can also be said of the backgrounds with its dark washed out colors. Most of the stages have environmental hazards which include lava, beds of spikes, and various other obstacles. The controls feel perfectly fine, although a bit uninspiring. A big problem with the game is the camera, which appears to be designed for a single player. Playing it multiplayer, it struggles to keep both players on the screen at the same time. How they let this get through the testing process, I'll never know. The game supports online multiplayer courtesy of Nintendo's Wi-Fi service. There are various things to unlock, including the ability to link up your DS to unleash even more content. The music is actually pretty good, with each character having a theme song from their respective games. The game features fast and furious gameplay and is geared more towards the casual fighting game fan. As far as Castlevania fans go, it's more of a curiosity than anything else. There was even a puzzle game entitled Castlevania Puzzle Encore of the Night, which was released for iOS and Android platforms. The gameplay is similar to Puyo Puyo with nice, bright, colorful graphics. You do have a couple of different options, including a story mode and an arcade mode, 
in which you play as any character from Symphony of the Night. Two thousand nine brought us Castlevania the Arcade from Konami. This oversized cabinet was released only in Japan and there were plans to bring it to the UK, but it only appeared in a few test markets. This is a light gun game, but instead of shooting, you are controlling a virtual whip. You have a button on top to activate the whip in which you swing to damage enemies and a button on the bottom to activate your sub weapons such as daggers. These do use up hearts, but they can be replenished by whipping the candles. The size of the cabinet is absolutely massive with both players entering from either side for a nice, dark, immersive experience. From watching the various videos online, the game looks to start in an outside area with skeletons stumbling towards you. The first chapter of the game ends with a boss fight against death at the gates of Dracula's castle. This is a two-player game and you can select three different players including Vampire Hunter, Lady Gunner, and the Little Witch. I wish I could say I've played this game, but unfortunately I haven't. If you ever get to Japan, be sure and check it out. Castlevania Resurrection was to be released on the Sega Dreamcast all the way back in the year 2000, but unfortunately it was cancelled. The game was set in the year 1666 and would focus on Sonya Belmont and a new character by the name of Victor Belmont. This was to be a fully 3D Castlevania game, the third in the series after the two previous outings on the Nintendo 64. The game was supposed to be more action-oriented than platforming or exploration. The camera had been reworked as well as the aiming controls. Rumor has it that the game was cancelled the same day Sony announced the PlayStation 2 essentially putting the nail in the coffin on the Sega Dreamcast. A beta has never been leaked online, although some early footage including the opening CGI animation and concept art did service on YouTube. Over the years, there have been countless pieces of merchandise available. Everything from t-shirts, Funko Pops, comics, a handheld LCD game, and also incredibly detailed figures from the various games. There are over 25 vinyl record releases of the soundtracks that covered almost all of the games. In 2017, Castlevania made its debut on Netflix as an adult animated series. The project started life as an 80 minute animated movie based around the events of Castlevania III Dracula's Curse and follows Trevor Belmont Alucard and Sylvia Belnades as they try to stop Dracula from taking over the nation of Wallachia. Warren Ellis wrote the script but could not fit everything he wanted to in such a short time span. The decision was made to break it up into a trilogy of movies and then finally an eight episode series with the content being geared towards adults. The series features extremely gruesome imagery and is definitely not suited for younger viewers. The presentation is spectacular with dark visuals and excellent music to boot. The series debuted to high numbers on Netflix and by the second season had garnered over 30 million viewers worldwide. The series is currently in its fourth season. Now I couldn't do a Castlevania video without mentioning the game Bloodstained Ritual of the Night. In 2014, longtime Castlevania producer Koji Igarashi left Konami after disagreements with the company over the direction it was taking. Due to numerous fan requests for another Metroidvania game, he decided to use Kickstarter and raised $5.5 million, the largest crowdfunded video game. 
This is considered the spiritual successor to Castlevania, and more specifically, Symphony of the Night. And just from looking at the gameplay, it's pretty obvious. The graphics are truly a work of art with extremely smooth animation, lots of colors, and very detailed characters and backgrounds. This is a platform game that sees your character explore a number of areas fighting monsters, finding keys, and exploring areas that previously were inaccessible. The gameplay was based on previous Castlevania titles such as Dracula X and of course, Symphony of the Night. There are 13 free DLC add-ons including a co-op mode as well as an 8-bit classic mode which looks very similar to the original Castlevania. The game was released for Windows, PS4, Xbox One, Nintendo Switch, iOS and Android. A companion title, Bloodstained Curse of the Moon was also released and is considered a spin-off of the original title. I had a lot of requests asking if I was going to cover the complete conversions and of course I was, but I just wanted to get all of the main games out of the way first. So let's go back to the year 1990 and take a look at the Commodore 64 version. Visually it's not too bad and looks similar to the NES original, although the sprites are a little bit larger, squatter and not quite as colorful. One thing I was looking forward to was the music thanks to the excellent SID chip in the Commodore 64. But unfortunately, that is just not the case. While it's decent, it's just nowhere near the quality of what the good old SID chip is capable of. There is one issue that is prevalent with this port and the Amiga port, and that is there is only one fire button to be used meaning you have to push up to jump. Most veteran home computer users are used to this type of control scheme, but to activate your sub weapons you have to hold in the fire button which totally throws off your timing. It's a decent platformer although it could have been a whole lot better. MS-DOS version is up next and I've said it before and I'll say it again, I wish it wasn't. At first glance it looks very similar to the NES title with a reduced color palette. As soon as the game is in motion though there is a slight stutter in the visuals, ranging from the character animations to the scrolling. And then we have the sound effects and music. This conversion is the epitome of bloops and bleeps and farts and queefs. This is probably the worst noise I have ever heard coming out of the PC speaker. What's even worse is that the sound effects actually drowned out the background music, but considering the quality, maybe that's a good thing. Supposedly there are certain sound cards that will work with the game which greatly enhances the sound, but I could only get the PC speaker to work. The controls are decent enough if you can get past the seizure inducing visuals. You do have the option of using two fire buttons this time around, so it is similar to the NES version. Out of all the home conversions, this one is by far the worst. Finally we come to the Amiga version. As a devoted Amiga fan, this was the one I was looking forward to back in 1990, but it just didn't pan out. The graphics have been redesigned to fit on a 320 by 200 screen, which has a higher resolution than the NES original, but the animation and scrolling are once again choppy choppy. 
It's not as bad as the horrendous and missed dolls version, but not as smooth as the original. The music is really good and much better than the NES in my opinion. The control scheme is exactly the same as the Commodore 64, meaning you only have one fire button to use, so of course sacrifices had to be made. Overall, it's not a bad conversion, but a second fire button and doing something about that jittery scrolling definitely would have helped. Now we come to the end of the history of Castlevania. Whew. When I started researching this video, I knew there were a lot of games in the series, but I had no idea there were over 30. I expected the series to be only two or three parts, so I didn't realize it would span five episodes. Castlevania is a classic franchise, and if you are a retro gamer, I am 99.9% .9 sure you've played one of these games in your lifetime. Here we are, 35 years later, still discussing this series of games, which is a testament to the longevity of the series. Hopefully, Konami will pull their head out of their butts and give us a new Castlevania game in the style of Symphony of the Night, only with updated visuals. It's been six years since we've had a proper Castlevania game, and I can't believe they have disregarded the franchise like a red-headed stepchild. At least we have the Bloodstained series in the meantime to play. I hope you've enjoyed this series of videos, and if you've never had a chance to take on Dracula, be sure and give this series a chance. You'll be glad you did. If you enjoyed this video or any of my content, be sure to leave a like, comment, share, and subscribe. Also, if you'd want to support me on Patreon, please click the link below. Thank you so much for watching.